Well, good day and welcome on Sunday, the 28th of November, 2021. And today we continue the prequel to Christmas. So this is the prequel to Christmas part two. And I've entitled this, People Get Ready, There's a Messiah Coming. And last week we looked at how the angel announced to Zacharias that he and his wife Elizabeth, in their old age, would be given a son. And that son would be special. And it says in Luke 1, 18, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him. Now, last week, we saw how that before him relates to the Lord their God. So this son that was to be born was to be a forerunner of the Lord himself. That's interesting. To go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this son's ministry would be that of preparation and of turning the hearts back to God. Now that's an interesting one. Let's have a look at what Zechariah, once the child was born, what Zechariah prophesied by the Holy Spirit about his life. In Luke 1, 76, it says this, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of sins through the tender mercies of our God. And so here again it is uh, reiterated that he is to go before the face of the Lord to prepare the way of the Lord. But in here also was added this, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, how? By the remission of their sins, or the removal of their sins. Now, what an amazing ministry that is, to turn their hearts back to God, to turn their hearts back to their children, to give them wisdom of the just instead of the wisdom of the disobedient and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now I know from history that when uh, say an American president is going to fly into a country and, and visit there's a whole entourage of people that are sent in before to make sure that he's got the right things in place, that the meetings are going to take place at the right time, to get the people ready and the, the place ready for the arrival of the president. And that is the principle here, that here John the Baptist is to go as a herald, one that is saying the Lord is coming and I am now preparing his way. And we're going to see that as we look at the scriptures today. And in verse 80 of Luke 1, it says this, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So it says that John was all those years in the desert preparing himself before the Lord to prepare Israel for the coming of their Messiah, the Lord himself. And so, what was his ministry? It was to turn their hearts to the Lord in preparation of his coming. And let's see how that was to be done. In Luke 3, Verse 2, it says, While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John 
the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It's very interesting here, because what that means is the first key to preparing our hearts to follow the Lord and his coming into our hearts and our lives is repentance. Now repentance is quite an easy word really, it sounds hard isn't it? But all repentance truly means is that we were going our own way, we were doing our own thing. And repentance means that we wake up to that, that our back is actually towards God's way. And so we recognize we're going the wrong way, we say we're going the wrong way, we ask God's forgiveness for going the wrong way, and we turn around and begin to go God's way. So instead of doing our thing, we now desire to do God's thing. And notice that when we were doing our thing, our back was towards God. But now when we desire to do God's things, our back is toward our own way. But our eyes now are fixed on God's way and what God wants for us. So effectively, repentance means to do a U-turn. We were going our own way, but now we desire to go God's way. And as we ask God's forgiveness and ask Him to come and change our lives, he gives us the strength to turn around. We're going to see how that comes in a moment. Now, Luke in chapter 3 says this about John. He says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now Luke here was quoting from Isaiah 40 and over these next moments we're going to look at the passage of Isaiah 40 and just unpack it to see how it lines up with actually what was happening. And so in Isaiah 40 verse 6 it says this, The voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Because the grass withers and the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You see the message of John the Baptist taken directly from Isaiah 40 verse 6 was that he was to cry out that all flesh is perishing, that just in the twinkling of an eye, in the moment, the grass can wither and the flower fade when it is faced with the holiness and the glory of God. And so, we need to make sure that our hearts are ready for his appearing. 
And so Luke 3 verse 7, John now speaks to the multitude in his ministry. He says this, then he said to the multitudes that came to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, whoop, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That, you know what, he's actually, he's saying, children of the serpent, you know? That's heavy stuff. No wonder Herod wanted to get rid of him. No wonder Herod wanted to get him out of the way. Because every time John spoke, it spoke to the heart of man. And man has two reactions. Either he says, yes, I am guilty, and says, Lord, I want to know you, and turn from his wicked ways. Or man is so affronted that we would even be called sinners, that he desires to shut up the messenger so he's not faced with it anymore. And he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And so we see John's ministry was to preach a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, baptism was a visual picture of being cleansed, of being washed from the muck of our sin. And so that baptism wasn't for salvation. It wasn't saving them. It was an outward picture of their turning in their heart. That as they repented, as they turned from their own way to God's way, that was visualized by the washing of the body in water. And so baptism gave that picture of an expression of repentance. And so John now in Luke 3 verse 8 says to those, look, you've come out to be baptized, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. You see, John was saying, if you're truly coming out to be baptized as a picture of a changed heart, God doesn't want to just see words. God wants to see a hunger and a desire for righteousness. God wants to see a change of behavior because that would be a fruit that you would lay your old past down and you would take up the pattern of Christ. And it says, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So John was saying, don't rely on, on being a child of Abraham, one of the children of God. He said, don't rely on your history. Because man looks on the history, looks on the outward, looks on your attendance at synagogue or whatever. But God looks on the heart. And so God wants to see a hunger and a desire for him that we might desire that change, that we might become more like Christ. And so in Luke 3, 9, it says, And even now, even now, says John, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. He's saying to Israel, your time has come. I'm preparing the way for the Messiah that is coming. Will your heart be ready? Will your heart desire to receive him? And he's coming to bring salvation 
and he's coming to bring a sword. Whoa, hang on, a sword? Yes, a sword to divide the sheep from the goats. Up until now, God has given everyone that opportunity to turn, to come to him, to listen to his word, because the word of our God stands forever. But now, as they used to say on Opportunity Knocks, <laughs> it's make your mind up time. It's the time where you need to choose, says John. And he says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. In other words, that time has come. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Whoa. Now you know, if anyone tells me that I've done something wrong, I get upset. I don't know about you. You get angry. You think, oh, who are they to tell me? And, and you know, who are they? They don't know me. You don't know me. And you know, that causes sorrow sometimes. And to be wounded by someone saying that we're going down a wrong path can hurt. But in Proverbs it says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Someone that is truly your friend won't allow you to, to carry on in a, a way that is leading to destruction. But someone that doesn't really care for you, but has a pretense of caring for you, will say, oh yeah, you carry on, you just do what you want, you know, don't listen to anybody else, you know. And don't listen to those who might call you out and say that you're doing wrong. That's what they would say to you. But faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend lets you know when you're going down a wrong road because he or she has your best interests at heart. Doesn't want you to destroy yourself. And so in 2 Corinthians, Paul, when he was writing to them, he was telling them off. He was saying, look, you're doing this wrong. You're completely self-centered. And when he wrote to them, he, he made them very sad and they got upset with him because he said that they were doing things wrong. But they were sorrowful. But Paul writes to them now, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9, it says, Now I rejoice, said Paul, not that you were made sorry. I'm not rejoicing that I, I upset you with it. But that your sorrow led to repentance. That by, by letting you know the truth, even though it upset you, it changed your view and you changed your heart. That sorrow led you to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner. God intended you to return to him and want to follow him. That's why he sent me to speak. That you might suffer loss from us in nothing. In other words, that you might miss out on nothing that God has for you. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Isn't that an amazing phrase? Godly sorrow. So a response to perhaps being told off or even reading God's word and seeing that like in a mirror that you, you got dirt on your face or egg on your face, you know? And that you need to deal with something. Instead of getting angry and putting the Bible aside or, or shouting at the person that spoke to you, that sorrow leads to repentance. That's godly sorrow. Produces repentance. 
leading to salvation. See, the amazing thing is that when we repent, that brings us one step further and it leads us to salvation itself, to live for God. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. You will never regret coming to the Lord Jesus, preparing your heart for him. But then it says this, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So by getting upset, so self-righteous, saying how dare they say that what I'm doing or how I'm living or the lifestyle I've chosen is wrong. Friend, if John appeared today on our streets, he would be arrested because he would say that we are not walking with God and that our attitude, our hearts, our lifestyle is just sinful towards God. And so the police would be arresting him because he would be offending people. And that's why Herod got rid of him. But you know what, friend? The Word of God and those who speak the Word of God are seeking to prepare your heart for the Lord. And we are preaching that it starts with true repentance, to ask God's forgiveness and a hunger and a desire, not for our old ways, but for God's righteousness and character to be shaped in our lives. Friend, where are you today? Where is your sorrow at knowing that we have gone wrong going to lead you? Will it be indignation against God? Or will it be a humble heart confessing our sin and asking his forgiveness? Well, the Lord bless you this week as we prepare now on this first Advent Sunday for the coming of the Lord and the celebration that we will have at his appearing. The Lord bless you.